Hello, everyone. Welcome to I Care Better Endo Unplugged. I'm Jandra Mueller, and I'm here today with Saeed Ghulami, the founder of I Care Better. And we're very interested to hear about I Care Better and a little bit about your backstory. And I'll let you share a little bit about that with us. Hi, Jandra. Hi, everyone who's listening. Uh, thank you, Jandra, for having me in the first podcast ever of I Care Better Endometriosis Unplugged. I am really excited about this. Um, talking uh, about endometriosis and my background, and, and this is like always gets me super excited, and, and I want to share a lot more than I usually can and time allows. So I hope I can do a decent job here. Uh, the first time that I saw a patient with endometriosis was when I was in medical school, I was a, a student in the surgical department and we had a patient. He, her his story, his story was patient comes back every month at a very specific point with rectal bleeding. And it, this has been the, his story for the last like years. And like no one knew what's the deal. Like everyone had like thoughts, but no one really thought about endometriosis. So what I did, I really, try to learn what's going on and then I did some research. I remember I did a Mayo Clinic website and there was a lot of studies around uh, repeating rectal bleeding and then we realized, wow, this patient had endometriosis. And I really was praised for that diagnosis at that point. <laughs> That's awesome. And that was my, my first exposure to endometriosis. And after that, especially when I started practicing as a primary care, we had these patients who come back for endometriosis every month and we didn't know what to do for them. And we got to a point that we would blame the pain on them. Like, it's your problem that you don't feel better. Like, oh, you're making it up, really. Like the typical things that is happening every day to patients. But I deep down I knew there is something wrong, especially because I had seen that patients before. I mean, we, we started looking around for gynecologists that can actually treat these patients. And there were so few of them. And these patients had no way to find them. So that's why uh, down the road when um, I got into this space, I, re I really wanted to create a database, a directory of great specialists who can treat these patients. So if a patient needs an ex expert and a specialist, they don't have to go to 10 or 20 different gynecologists to find one out of luck, out of dumb luck. We, we wanted to do that. So that's how, how we got excited about this problem and we wanted to have patients and, and we launched this platform for endometriosis. The initial challenge was we didn't know how to select our specialists because there are a thousand different ways. You can go based on reviews, based on whatever. Uh, until uh, I talked to some of the experts in the space, Dr. Mossbrocker, Dr. Vidali, Dr. Sinervo, and uh, some advocates in the space, uh, so Sally Sorrell and, and Heather uh, Goyden. Uh, so the thought was let's do video vetting of the experts, of the surgeons. There, are, there were other experts too involved in, the, in this uh, discussion. So we started doing the video vetting, which means Surgeons submit their videos, then some other surgeons peer review the videos and rate them. And if the rating is high enough, that surgeon is a good endometriosis excision surgeon. So that's how we initially started the group of doctors that we had. Then from there, we started building up work. We work on the access, we work on physical therapy. But I don't want to make it a monologue, so I'll, I'll leave it up to you to ask questions um, and move forward with that. Perfect. I have so many questions from the information you just said. I want to go back to when you were a primary care specialist and, you know, after your experience as a, a med student identifying the, the rectal bleeding and how it was cyclical. Um, as a PCP, I have many questions on this, but as a PCP, how did you feel kind of getting to that place? It sounds like there was, you know, I know I don't know something, but what kind of language was used in those patient visits? You know, what was that process like as a provider 
being feeling unable or unequipped to kind of diagnose that patient or feel like you could help them. Right. So something that hurt me in, in those visits in general, when, when you see a patient and you cannot help them, it, it really hurts me. And I'm pretty sure it hurt many people. And especially when it comes to pain, pain is a painful situation for patients, but also it's very painful for doctors too, because there's always conflicting emotions and thoughts. Do we give them opioids? Do we take this pain seriously or they are just making it up? For different reasons, because a lot of uh, times some people might just say they have pain to gain some opioids in emergency departments, but you always don't know who is right and who is not. So it's a really conflicting situation for doctors to, to make a decision. So back to where I was, yes, when you see a patient coming back with pain and other issues and you can't help them, first of all, that uncertainty really hurts. And deep down, you feel like unable to help, like when you, have, when you, you, when you are not able to do things that you are supposed to do as a doctor, it's like really not a good experience. And, and people experience this, like if you are a top surgeon or top oncologist and you know your patient is gonna die in a month, that's a really bad experience and a lot of people get burned out for that. So back to a PCP situation, you have a patient with pain, you just don't know what to do for them or what to do with them. Then maybe that's the defense mechanism that you blame it on them. You just wanna make yourself happy deep down that it's not my problem they are it's a it's a very conflicting emotion i never forget um my emotions when i see or think about patients with endometriosis it always just gets to me and never it never gets like repetitive or it, it never gets boring it's always like it makes me emotional when i think about this pain and yeah and it, i think that is a good point or segue into, you know, eventually you started to try to find specialists because in reality, you only have, you know, a certain extent of training to have the tools to help these people. But I think that it's a big difference when you go beyond that and out of your way to help to find answers, right? And I'm sure that, you know, you mentioned trying to search and finding very few specialists. What were things that you were looking for as a physician to help find that information with the limited information you knew at that point? You know, you usually don't know what you don't know, and you know there are things that you don't know. When I contacted the, per, the general, uh, the gynecologist, and still at this point, and the first thing was, would you like to have endometriosis patients? And to my awe, many OBGYNs, they don't want endometriosis patients in their office. Interesting. Because, because of, I know, because of that sense of uncertainty and that sense of, I can't help this person. And it, if this person comes to my office with endometriosis pain and issues that they can't handle, it just makes me feel bad and makes me anxious. And I don't want to be a doctor who can't help his or her patient. Yeah. So, so that's, I, under, I think in the core, the doctors who don't really like, they, they don't want endometriosis patients to go to them. They have that self-awareness that they can't help them, but also they really don't want to hurt themselves and hurt patients. So I understood them. So basically, first of all, the first question is, do you like to see endometriosis patients? And now I think I should tell this story. We, we, we sent email to couple of thousands of OBGYNs in the US and asked them, would you like to see endometriosis patients? And we had like zero positive response. Like no one, no one said, yes, we want to see these patients. So that's basically a story. Like you said, how we figured out. First of all, a simple question, would you like to see endometriosis patients? And they say, no. And no. Yes. So 90, over 90% just, they just exclude themselves. And from the ones who want to see the patients, we just keep asking more questions. Like, how do you treat their pain? How do you, when do you think they are good for surgery? And with some of these questions, we could figure out like some doctors understand the disease and might do things for patients. That was the initial raw way, like very raw and like, you know, uneducated way of our decision-making 
to who is the good doctor for us. And we didn't have like a million patients. We had like a couple of thousands of patients. And from all those patients, probably a handful had endometriosis at that point. So we just were finding uh, resources for them. So that's how we basically contact them, ask them questions and figure they are good or not. Very (laughs) non-scientific. Yeah, but probably still more than many people are still doing today. You know, it's kind of, oh, the birth control, you know, let's change your birth control. It's not helping. I'm not sure. And so I think that even though it seems small, I think it's it means a lot to patients to take that extra step and try to find providers. Um, I, I hear a lot of patients kind of express that you know, their providers that they saw for many years and have had these conversations, you know, they could be great providers for their their other issues. But when it came to endo, I think a lot of patients would have just really appreciated them saying, you know, I, I don't know what more I can do for you, but like, let's try to figure it out. And I think that seems really small. And as providers, we want to help our patients, but that is helping our patients. And I think yeah, many people have given that feedback and just even knowing that I think gives them hope or it doesn't uh, give them the false illusion that I'm going to keep coming to you. And at some point we're going to figure it out together. So that's a really important point you brought up. I mean, in the mind of a doctor could be a PCP or general OBGYN. Like the problem sounds simple, period pain, right? That's the most common complaint of endometriosis and this is like in medical school they make it sound really simple and unimportant like you immediately think all right it's period pain all right this is normal usually like it just they, it's seated in your mind now to a, when you get to a point that this is period pain and this patient is here for period pain and and it's supposed to be normal it's supposed to be not important why it's like so like overwhelming now for us as providers and for then at that point you don't want to admit that you learned it wrong you learned the wrong thing you you didn't know it you don't want to admit it that 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 admission i think is the problem that's an ego problem you don't want to admit all right this was wrong we didn't know it let's send this patient to someone who can help yeah that's where it i think uh gets into that you know, barriers of not referring patients after sending them different into different different uh, directions of birth controls or pain management. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about I Care Better. And so that's great to know that that's how it started. And I think um, in the U.S., we really don't have a standardization or, you know, training program, the U.K. and some some other countries do have a more rigorous process to be considered a specialist or expert in endometriosis and especially for the surgeons. And so we have a few different avenues in the U.S. Um, One where most people probably know of is Nancy's Nook and it's per patient report and very much education. I think it's changed a lot of patients' lives and being able to find that and you know, talk with others and get some good information. But I think I Care Better does step up the standard. From what I've seen in the progression is, you know, you used to go to a doctor and if they said ablation, if you knew, you know, enough about it, you would know, okay, that's not the right, um, the right doctor for me. And you would find somebody with excision and sort of that term kind of insinuates that they have the proper training, you know, they're looking everywhere, they're identifying all of the different types of lesions. And I feel now we've kind of gone into the space where I don't really see a lot of patients coming from doctors that do ablation anymore, but sort of excision is the new best thing. And that's a harder thing to navigate at your appointment because you trust that they do excision, but are they doing it everywhere? Are they taking one biopsy? Are they being able to recognize all of the different types of endo and address it properly, patients don't know to ask those questions. And I think even as a PT, I would be hesitant to question the doctor's ability. And so how do we really know? And so the video vetting, I think, does add that extra layer of confidence. And although there are other good providers that aren't on the site yet, we need to help push them to get on the site. at least you know that if one of those doctors is on there, they are probably doing exactly what they need to be doing. 
Yes. I mean, you just nailed it in head, obviously. Um, we just don't know who is good, who is not as a patient. And these doctors need to have their widows rated. And there was a study in the England Journal of Medicine in 2013. And they collected the widow of uh, laparoscopic surgery, of bariatric surgery, uh, from co- several surgeons and they de-identified the video and sent it to a group of other experts to rate the surgical skill based on that video of that surgery. And they, then they plotted the surgical skill against the complication rate. And if the surgical skill was higher, the complication rate was lower. So obviously, surgical skill rated by experts has a correlation with the complication rate, a reverse correlation. So that was the scientific basis of like, all right, if we want, let's let's rate the skill of surgeons for their skill in excision of surge, ex- endometriosis based on this study, right? And of course, I mean, no one knows uh, if this surgeon goes in, does ablation or excision, or can can recognize all the lesions because endometriosis can present itself in several ways. It's not just one discoloration or this specific way. It could be ways that you don't even imagine that unless mm-hmm. you have seen this before. So yeah, uh, we facilitate that process, facilitate the process of a surgeon putting their videos and being reviewed to make sure they have the skills of recognizing and removing the lesions uh, our problem is that as you said not all great surgeons are willing to be reviewed a part yeah. of it goes to you know their pride like they they have pride in their work they don't want to be reviewed like they consider themselves a world leader why should you review me that's one problem that we we have been trying to like lower the barrier and make sure help them to come over that decision and and come and be vetted for patient's sake Uh, the other part is the fee like we Mm -hmm. used to charge a fee for doctors i mean there is an application fee people surgeons need to pay and we basically give that money to people who review the videos because the reviewers are spending their time and we pay them so we make almost no money we lose up to 500 dollars per application because Mm -hmm. our time is spent and we don't get paid for it and also we have to pay more to reviewers than the 400 dollars application so the reason i'm saying numbers numbers are boring but i think it's important because that's the bear that's the biggest barrier of not having a lot of great surgeons then we used to have that fee of 1399 per year for some surgeons it just didn't make sense they didn't want it they didn't want more patients mm-hmm. or they didn't want patients trust so we are, we are trying to overcome that barrier by basically waiving the fee for every surgeon who doesn't want to pay or who, does, who doesn't have the means to pay. So basically now a, per, a surgeon can apply, get vetted, be on the website for free right now. No fee yeah. included, nothing. And I think coming into this now, there are, I think, some experts that are very well known that would probably be like, yeah, I don't, you know, people know me, I'm, I'm making these changes and Mm -hmm. I am known because of that. So that is helpful to know. And I think it's helpful to know like where that money goes and yeah, it's time, right? So if you want to have a good platform where you, where ultimately the goal is to allow patients to have, to have that confidence in selecting a surgeon, especially if there's one local to them, you know, I think that that's important in the overall care of endo for sure. Yes. And we, we have do, learned. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Oh, I was going to say, where do you see, what's the goal of I Care Better? What's the kind of grand scheme that you envision? Yes. You know, we have three problems with endometriosis. So there are basically three problems in the world of medicine. We have all of them in endometriosis. <laughs> we have problem, we had problem of availability of experts. I believe we can, we could solve it with the vetting and finding the right experts. Now, the expertise and the mean for finding expertise are available. The second problem is accessibility. Now we are focused on accessibility. Means like a, a patient needs to have a doctor within a reasonable access. They don't have to try across continents or oceans to get to a good surgeon. So 
Now we are focused on accessibility so people can find the doctor within a reasonable range without going through that much trouble. The third problem would be affordability of care. So affordability means a lot of great surgeons now for doing good surgery and keeping the standards high, they need to go out of network because if they stay in network and do this good job, the pay is so low, they are going to go broke probably. Um, so affordability, make sure that patients can afford these surgeries done by these top experts who had to go out of network to keep the standards high. So th these are the direction that we are going. Basically, now we make it available. Uh, the current focus is accessibility, make, bring enough experts on the platform, make sure everyone has a doctor for diagnosis or at least for simple surgeries. Then the next stage would be make care more affordable. And that's my ultimate goal. Yeah, I think that's a huge one for both providers and patients. Um, you know, I have the availability of in-network when maybe they're spending so much money on healthcare because of all the issues along with endometriosis. And the thing that, you know, they learn that is going to save them is the surgery, but it's going to cost them a ton of money and, and, it, and it limits the care. But on the other side, I think for providers, I think it's always a battle of, you know, is this the right thing to do? But if I don't do this, can I actually help? And I think each side doesn't always see the, the other side of things. Um, so I think that's a, a really important piece is to better the payment for providers uh, that decide to continue taking insurance, but also, you know, those that don't because the training is, I'm sure, expensive. I know as a PT, everything is kind of on our own budget. Um, luckily, I work for a great company that has a pretty decent stipend, but it still is only, you know, one or two courses or conferences a year. And it, I don't just do endometriosis. And so we do run a cash-based practice. And I do spend a lot of time educating patients about why that is. And we are an hour one-on-one -on -one, and most PT places, you know, you, you're lucky if you're 30 minutes with your provider and just for these complex conditions, it, it can't work to give good care and to be educated in everything we need to be. So I, I think that's the same issue with when it comes to surgeons with endometriosis. Exactly. Like now we have a lot of great physical therapists like yourself and some other people in your team on I, I Care Better because that's also a very necessary part of care for endometriosis. The same issue, the same thing. It's just the lack of understanding of endometriosis and its complications and its impacts on the person's life and further costs by the insurance companies and the payers, that's a big problem. We wanted to solve it. Unfortunately, our network needs to be much bigger than it is to get their attention. They just don't pay attention to us. We are too small to talk to them. They just don't take us seriously. So we need to have a bigger network, a bigger group of providers who are in it. Then we can go and probably change something for them. Um, yeah, well, hopefully 100%. with this podcast, we'll get there. And yeah, maybe we should talk a little bit about why we created this podcast so everyone knows. Yes, I. that's my question from you. Um, so, you know, we know each other for a long time now. Uh, over a year, we have been communicating. We have had several meetings, brainstorms, and you were really involved with endometriosis care and education for PTs. And I always was fascinated about your passion and your knowledge until we had this discussion, let's work together a couple of weeks ago. And, and you brought up this idea that you had in your mind for the podcast, which I had it in my mind. I just didn't have the right person to help me do it. And you brought it up. I'm really curious, like, what's your story? How you got here? Why a podcast? Why endometriosis? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'll kind of tell you how I got here. It's it, it's not what many people think. I, I'm pretty open about my story. Um, so I have endometriosis. And in short, why I really focus on this disease is, you know, I was a pelvic floor PT long before I had known that I had endometriosis. And about, I don't know, four and a half years into already doing pelvic floor physical therapy, I had a major 
stressful event that kind of triggered a lot of symptoms. And it took me three years of trying to find any sort of answers. And when I did, it really opened my eyes. Like, I'm in the perfect position to be able to know what's going on. And I had no clue and not for lack of trying. I saw, you know, GI doctors. I saw OBGYN several. I worked at a clinic that I just popped into the ultrasound tech's office and she would ultrasound me and I would talk to the radiologist and, you know, just going from person to person and, well, your IUD might not be working this time. Let's put you on birth control and see if that goes. I'd been on birth control my whole life. And, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. When I was 13 is when I really did have symptoms. And I was the first time that there was a really big issue shortly after I started my period. I was in the shower, curled in the fetal position, couldn't move. And my brother and my mom had to put me in the car and take me to the ER where they gave me morphine and basically did all the tests. And she's fine. That She probably ruptured a cyst, take her to OBGYN. They did. And it from there, from 13 to 20, it was the ring, this pill, that pill. And you know, looking back, because I didn't know anything about endometriosis back then, I think it did actually help my symptoms. I couldn't tolerate it for a thousand other other reasons, but I never really had period pain. If anything, I would say around ovulation would be the biggest issues. So it was never discussed with me. And then I, you know, was I guess fine for a long time until this event. And it just made me really frustrated that in the position I was in, it still took three years of actively trying to figure out what was going on and not get answers. And I ha- it, I have no idea, you know, it, it's incredible that all the patients that really have done the research and, and got to this point without having that medical background, it, it amazes me. And so I just got frustrated and angry and wanted to change that and better understand this. And That's sort of how I got into that. And many people that do know that I have endo, I think, assume that I started to get into public PT because of that. But it was totally unrelated. Even my even going to PT school, I had PT when I was 17. And honestly, it was awful. And I never thought I would be here. So it was kind of by chance that I ended up where I ended up. But obviously, it's for a reason. So yeah, just kind of kept going with it, learning and uh, Brit. And I, my colleague, Britt Gossi, she's in Iowa, we got put together and somebody had said, you know, uh, you guys should create an endometriosis course. You both have it. You're both PTs. I think you'd be great. And that's kind of where it started. And it's, it's slowly progressing, but we've gotten great feedback from it so far and just helping spread the awareness. So uh, that's when we met you. That's great. And um... And I have to tell you, um, I have to tell whoever listens to this, that uh, you have a practice, like you work in a practice in San Diego, right? Um, can you tell us about your practice? Like, what do you work on? Like, if you see an endometriosis yeah. patient, how that looks like? Yes. So I work at the Pelvic Health and Rehabilitation Center, and I am our clinical director in the Encinitas, which is in San Diego, California. And... Um, I started here in 2016, and this was in the middle of my journey of understanding endometriosis. So we treat all pelvic health, but we really do specialize in complex chronic pelvic pain. And I started in our LA office, and that's when I was introduced to Dr. Orbuck. She had uh, just moved from the East Coast, um, both Iris and Larry Orbuck, into California. And, you know, she really was a game changer for me and helping educate me about what this disease was, answering all my questions. We shared patients and really learned a lot from her about about this disease. And um, moving down to San Diego, I think I see males, females, we see those undergoing gender affirming surgeries. But endo is unique because aside from maybe the male um, public pain issues, you know, it can be every pelvic pain diagnosis you see in one patient, you know, you know, some people come in with painful sex, non endo related or urinary issues or constipation. 
But in endo, you can have every single one of those diagnoses just in one case. And so it it makes it complex and it it's different for every person. While many people have pelvic floor dysfunction, sometimes you get to treating them and after a few visits, everyone's going to have findings, right? Um, if you pulled somebody off the street, you're going to find tight muscles or dysfunction, but it's really about relating it to their symptoms and being a part of an overall care team. So it's not just PT, it's not just surgery, um, and really helping be that case manager essentially for patients and helping them navigate the system. So it's building relationships with other specialists, you know, endosurgeons, GI doctors, naturopaths, um, whatever, a psychologist, that's a huge one, a urologist, to really get a team together and help facilitate that discussion among us for the patient and let that patient take a break from trying to explain medical terms and going to this doctor and this and who's good. So we really try to help in a cohesive way find those people for our patients with endometriosis. That's pretty amazing. I mean, you know, this like holistic view of the disease is it's not that common. And I'm glad that you're teaching other PTs to learn about this. So from that, uh, so you were helping patients from that. How, how you came up with the idea of the podcast? Uh, why did you want to do one? There are other podcasts in the community. There are podcasts all over the places about endometriosis. You can probably find five to ten podcasts. So what's, what do you think uh, is important for you to do in a podcast that there aren't out there? Yeah, I think that my initial, for a few years, I wanted to do a podcast. And I think my strength in education comes from speaking on podcasts, teaching at conferences. I'm definitely not the TikTok star. <laughs> and I think I had to be okay with, you know, with all aspects of social media. This is one that I feel comfortable with and I like doing. I've done a few episodes on, as a guest on podcast and I, and I loved it and I loved speaking about it. And I would find from people um, that I didn't know or that weren't my patients, they are now calling and saying, hey, I heard what you said on this podcast. I want to make an appointment with you, whether that was telehealth or they were local in person. I even had a patient. This was so funny. I had started seeing her and she had already had a hysterectomy, a young woman, early 30s, and they didn't do it. You know, they did a hysterectomy, but there was endo there and they and they left it. And so she found some specialist and they referred her to me. And maybe it was our third or fourth session. She came into the appointment. She's like, this is so funny. My mom sent me this podcast like, oh, you should listen to this. It has some good information. And it was the podcast that I was on with Dr. Fruscio. So she was laughing and she's like, yeah, that's the PT that I'm seeing. So that was really cool. And I, I just think it reaches a lot of people. I love listening to podcasts and I find that it's a good way to listen on your commute or just get information where you don't have to read or search and just hear what different people have to say. And yeah, there are a lot of great, you know, endo podcasts on endo, whether it's the entire show or just different episodes. And I think everybody comes with a slightly different view, but I really wanted this podcast to kind of highlight all areas of endometriosis, um, you know, hear what the experts have to say, hear how they treat and how that might be different from the next person or pelvic floor PTs. And I hope to bring, you know, we hope to bring on mental health professionals, um, but also to give a platform for patient voices to really help bridge that gap and help patients understand some of the behind the scenes that the doctors are going through in their practices and why the decisions are that uh, whether they take cash and why that is or how they approach things in different ways, but also for other patients to hear both good information from experts, but also to hear how other patient stories, while they may have different circumstances, are very similar to their own and they don't feel isolated. And also, hopefully, if providers are listening to this too, like get a better understanding of what this process does look like for patients, um, because it is a reality that they have seen many doctors and they do their research and 
yes, well, they don't have a medical degree, like they've lived with this and they have found information and, you know, and let's bring this together and work together as a team to, to improve the care for, for people with endometriosis. Right. Yes. I think this is really important um, that we bring other people, like other people that most doctors or patients wouldn't even think of, like, for example, mental health or other specialists that you mentioned in this space. And, and the ultimate goal definitely is to uplift the community as a whole, like make sure the providers know what's going on, patients know what's going on, uh, everyone, industry leaders, like we need to have industry leaders know what's going on. And everyone knows their own segment the best way, like a surgeon knows what's going on in surgery, but we need to have this holistic discussion like to for a surgeon to know what is going on in insurance and in the payers space. So just connecting different dots together and bring it to people to learn. I think that's a really good idea, like a mental health specialist, because you mentioned that I'm pretty sure there are people out there might not consider it as, as important for some patients, mm-hmm. but but just talking about it and discussing with it. And this is this is really cool. So you had the idea for a couple of years and uh and then I could say you had really good passion about it. Why do you think this is the right time to launch this podcast? I don't know if there is, you know, a right time, but I will say what I've noticed is in the last few years, there's been a lot more information or discussion around endometriosis. I had a patient tell me the other day, you know, it's really nice. Like I had said something in a in a group to some people I didn't know and And it was the first time they had heard even like, you know, I think one of their friends, partners or something say like, oh, yeah, I've heard of that, you know, tell me more about it. And I think that was encouraging because especially if you're, you know, not female or assigned female at birth, you don't know it. It's not talked about. It's it's a secret among this community. And I think the fact that other people are even like, oh oh, what's that? But I've heard it is encouraging, but also the research. Um, There's been, I think that there's right now huge advancements in what people are wanting to look at in endo, both on diagnosis standpoint, but also better understanding the disease, the genetics, um, things like that. And I, I would love to allow more people to hear about those things and start to understand there is more to it. And just kind of keep an update as to what's going on in the world of endometriosis. So we stay on top of it and, you know, hopefully somebody hears this podcast and knows somebody and shares it with them. And it just reaches a a big, a bigger population than we currently have. This is awesome. Yes. I love it. Um, I totally think this is totally agree that this is the right time for such podcasts because now people are starting to learn. This could be a multidisciplinary effort not just in care, but also in finding solutions. There are some non-invasive diagnostic companies trying to build things like there are a lot of new surgical tools. So things are getting really like big and in very sub-specialized ways. So we have to make sure that we also have a holistic understanding of the whole disease. And I think this is a really good idea. And this is the, a really good timing for that podcast. And um What's your goal? What do you want to achieve with the podcast in the next one year? So over the next year, my hope is to bring on all different specialists, surgeons, mental health providers, um, naturopaths, PTs, and just talk to them and have open conversations. Even people that maybe we don't think about behind the scenes, um, you know, people from insurance to help explain some of that or people from some of the drug companies to for us to better understand how they're doing research, you know, what, what, what does it look like in the next, you know, X amount of years for treatments? I know that there have been more people looking into drugs that are more based on inflammation versus just, you know, hormonal suppression. And I think hearing from those people too, and getting backgrounds would be soup would be great. I think, I would love to know about that. So I'm hoping to just bring on specialists and and then hear patient stories in between and 
just help get the word about endometriosis out there um, and would love to, you know, we want this to be a dynamic podcast where we want people to listen. So we also want to hear from everyone, you know, what do you want? What do you want to hear about? What's missing? And cater to what you all want to hear. And we offer the platform for it. So we are willing to listen and bring on those people and get the information out to everybody. That's great. I love it. I mean, just listening to what you were describing, I, I'm really excited to listen to all those podcasts like just just listening to topics that you have in mind and and you want to build with this podcast and you want to discuss it it's just i can't wait for that i i wish there was a podcast that i could listen to all of these things that you just said but you know we are gonna fill that gap thank you yes so we're very excited to bring this podcast to you this is i care better endo unplugged and we will be releasing episodes weekly so stay tuned and please leave us comments and let us know what you like to hear and we look forward to speaking with you every week anything else you want to add thank you jandra and thank you everyone who is listening Yes, thank you too. And thank you for creating this platform.